which day, for me anyways. Happy Tuesday. I hope everybody has been well, and I hope everybody had a nice New Year's. I am back after a little vacation from my podcast, and I hope that all of you have been kind to yourself in our time apart. Today, I want to talk about why we as humans find the concept of love so important. I want to look at the actual science behind this because it's something that, you know, I've had a considerable amount of time in my life thinking about. I've often found myself uh, wondering why exactly I find love so important to pursue, right? And things like money, food, safety, all of those are important. We, those are the basic necessities we need to survive, at least in this life world time. But why is love on that list right next to food and money and safety and water to us bipedal folk out there? Looking into it, you know, I found a very interesting article from South University where a Dr. Rachel Needle explained the scientific substances uh, such as oxytocin, which we talked about, phenylthiamine, thylamine, Phenyl, thylamine, <laughs> and dopamine all have been found to play a role in that human experience associated with the behavior of love. They function similar to amphetamine, which make us alert and excited and give us, you know, those bondy feelings. Our brain on love experience experiences quite a bit of uh, an interesting experience that both men and women report similar sensations for. You know, all of us have heard the saying, you know, or the term falling in love, right? However, I feel like most of us who have felt like we were in love or, you know, we find a crush or whatever, right? The feeling of love can really attest that uh, it doesn't really feel like falling because it's, you know, we're up on cloud nine. Doesn't Falling doesn't seem like a very accurate verb here. There was a poem that I love, and I feel like a lot of people have seen it, you know, especially if you fill your life with a lot, lots of love and dubby, 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 dub shit, like me, right? Atticus poetry, At Atticus, Atticus poetry, like To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus poetry. Um, he's an anonymous Canadian poet residing somewhere in California. He wrote in one of his poems, Love Her Wild, quote, In all the wild world, there is no more desperate a creation than a human being on the verge of losing love. When I read that, I was like, oh, yeah, ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? You know, we, we, we meaning scientists, meaning humans, I don't mean you personally, but human beings, you know, have tried to research the chemical cocktail uh, that's created in our brain associated with love. You know, they've taken it apart and obviously a lot of you cynics out there are just like, you know what, this is probably due to the initial biological desire to perpetuate our species and continue to breed, right? Yeah. And, you know, humans, of course, we differentiate ourselves from the common quote-unquote animal when we think, no, 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 love is more special, right? The, the more, uh, the more, the less cynical people out there are just like, no, 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 no. Love is very special and, you know, attributed to just humans. Science focuses Charlotte Corney says that neuroscience can actually answer that question. Does any other species actually feel love like human beings, right? And what it tells us is that animals have all the physiological attributes needed to experience the love bug, right? Research showed that behaviorally, we see animals displaying extraordinary evidence of grief, care, and empathy, not only just towards each other, like their own species, but towards human companions. And, you know, these researchers believe 
if animals could say I love you in English, right? Or in people talk. They would. There was an interesting theory that I actually researched not too long ago called the triangular theory of love. More or less stumbled upon it. Hadn't heard from it or about it until recently. When I initially saw triangular theory of love, I was just like, okay, this sounds like it's going to be annoyingly accurate. It was developed by a psychologist by the name of Robert Sternberg. He more or less stated that there are three components of love. Intimacy, passion, and commitment. He explains that intimacy encompasses feelings of attachment, closeness, and connectedness, as well as bondedness. Passion encompasses drives connected to both limerence, which is feelings of love, and sexual attraction. Commitment, the third and final, encompasses, in short term, the decision to remain with another, and in long term, the shared achievements and plans made with that other person. Which is very interesting. Elizabeth Kane, a teacher in clinical psychology and behavioral science at South University, explained that romantic love grows when someone feels attachment and having their psychological needs met. A lot of researchers agree that obviously the little cocktail of drugs that our brain creates plays a part in this. Arguably the biggest part. And I know that I explained in another episode about the intoxicating produced drug in our brains during an orgasm, which is oxytocin. It increases a couple's ability to bond. And that is why it's so interesting, especially how we navigate sex and how we as human beings have sex for pleasure and not, not all the time for love. You know, we've heard it in poems and movies and music. It has been shoved in our face since the dawn of time. Love is a drug. And they couldn't have been more literal. In the short time that we're on this earth, you know, we start to uh, learn a little bit more about this, right? And funny enough, a survey conducted by the Siemens Festival Nights interviewed 2,000 people about their romantic and sexual histories. Among that sample size, and this is where it's going to get a little shocking. One out of seven participants didn't find the person they were with to be the, quote, love of their life, unquote. Of those one in seven, 73% of those people, the one in seven of the 2,000, 73%, that's more than half, way more than half, made do with their partner. So they settled after they felt true love fell through their fingers. What's surprising, what's even more surprising, because when I was reading this study, I was like, holy fucking shit, every other sentence. What's surprising here is that apparently these quote unquote settled relationships didn't stop con like looking for the real thing. Like they still are just like, okay, I have John or Jane Doe here. They're committed to me. We fill our basic needs with each other. However, I'm still going to be looking for Prince Charming or Princess Fiona, right? 17% of those adults polled had already met the love of their life since getting with their current partner. Yikes. You know, it, it, from this poll, it's only concluded, <laughs> it's a very cynical poll, <laughs> that it's uh, very hard to find the one. Claire Jarvis, she was the director for Siemens, uh, she was interviewed, and she felt that in this poll it was more or less insinuated that that the general perception is women fall in love more often than men but this poll kind of debunked that and revealed that men and women fall in love on average two times in their life two times one two and again it sucks that a lot of these people poll 2,000 people which is a lot of fucking people if you've ever been in a, in a small room with 40 people it feels like a lot imagine 2,000 is that, you know, people really don't believe that their current partners are the love of their life. But I'll give you guys a little glimmer of hope because there was another study with an additional 2,000 people in 2012 that kind of contradict, not kind of, it contradicted that one stating that on average, a person can fall in love a maximum of four times in their life, which is great. It sounds a lot more optimistic than the two, 
I don't know why. Just, you know, four sounds better than two. You know, me being who I am, I can't really say I've fallen in love more than two times in my life just yet. And I'm 27. I found in a lot of instances that I'm particularly starved for genuine romantic connections, especially in this romantically starved hookup culture that uh, my generation is currently, you know, stuck in the middle of, right? That whole idea of quote unquote, no feelings, says the men and women who are trying to fight the forming drug habit of a sex only interaction. Playing chicken with drugs usually only ends in one way. You don't win. <laughs> Especially in the case of released oxytocin from an orgasm. I guess the only way that this could be avoided is just never orgasming. But who the fuck wants to do that? Nobody. This is why I've always preached staying and growing with people that you find a genuine connection with before you uh, indulge in the brain juice of oxytocin with a good dickin' or pussin'. Yes, I said pussin'. We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> because while our generation has tried to simplify the idea of sex, you'll notice one or both of you always end up getting hurt because there is no way to try to negate that specific concoction of drugs that is supposed to bond one human to another is what you guys need to understand once you have sex once you come right once you orgasm your brain is creating a bonding drug thinking hey you know this person is my person this person is going to hunt and gather for me this person is going to be able to carry my children you know it, it is it is a chemical concoction made to bond to not only you know, perpetuate the species, right? Because the whole point of sex is to reproduce. But it's like, okay, this is my person. Your body doesn't fucking know the difference. Do you think your brain is just like, you know what? This is not serious. We're just gonna, we're just, we're just having sex. And that's where, you know, it's like, don't say you're just having sex. <laughs> because just having sex means that your brain is registering that you are just trying to bond with another human being. That's like saying you're going to go swimming and not get wet. Makes no sense. And we have to try to decipher, pick apart why we, we as a culture, right? A, you know, my generation, maybe the generation above and below, have created the idea of a sex-only relationship. And that's usually because one or both of you struggle with intimate closeness due to trauma, either past or present, that has not been rectified within yourself. Our mental health couldn't be more important in this state because we're fighting against the natural human desire to couple up and protect each other. Humans are, in my opinion, pack animals. We thrive in a safe pack where we all protect each other. Not saying that everybody wants a family, but everybody's idea of a family is different. Sometimes it's with a big group of friends. Sometimes it's with all your cousins. Sometimes it's an actual, you know, like you reproduce and you have children and then that's your family, right? Sometimes it's just a family is just two people. So a family can mean different things. It doesn't mean you have to get pregnant and have a child. When we're alone all the time, right, our mental health suffers. Even if you like being alone, right, you, you still at some point even if it's in its smallest measure, get your little dose of human interaction. When we're deprived of sunlight, our mental health declines. Look at the people in Seattle with the highest suicide rate because they get the least amount of sun. When we're starved of proper nutrition and hydration, our mental health declines. Duh. Feeding yourself and drinking water. Not soda, not juice, not tea, not coffee. Water. With no additives, just water. H2O. We have to ask ourselves why we are so apt and willing to avoid doing the necessary work required to continue to strive in a happy, loving relationship. With not only yourself, but with others. Friends, family, romantic partners, etc. When you think about it, my generation is full of little druggies. Little brain druggies. We're all looking for that next hit of oxytocin with sex when we're lonely, stressed, or depressed because it gives us a break from what plagues us internally. Me personally, I get two little cheeseburgers from McDonald's when I'm fucking depressed or sad or happy. 
we're celebrating. I just, you know, it's like my little, it's, it's like a reward. <laughs> as someone who's embarked on that hookup train, and as someone who has recently learned what genuine touch, absent of surface level lust felt like, I can honestly say that genuine touch turned me on and out more than any casual dickens. Why? I can only surmise that it's probably due to the very careful concoction of both oxytocin and the primal need for safety. Because women are, you know, women couple up with somebody they feel is going to protect them. And this is just... This is all around. It doesn't matter what your sexual preference is. I feel like women genuinely look for a partner that is going to physically protect them, emotionally protect them. You usually don't feel like your casual dickens or pussin is going to protect your honor in the matter of a zombie apocalypse. Maybe you do. I never have. I've had instances where I just knew that a fuck buddy would use me as a human shield for any inconvenience. Just fucked up. We're not going to talk about it. And I've moved on. <laughs> you know, I've filled my time and my life with a lot of images and text and music full of love and happiness because I personally have always dreamt of that life of peace and love. You know, that life where I see my mom, you know, sleepily dragging herself into the kitchen to wrap her arms around my dad's waist while he's making his morning coffee. Or the love and the attention I see from my grandfather when he watches my grandmother shuffle around the kitchen, poking lovingly co loving comments to her, you know, and her getting all frustrated and it's the fucking cutest thing in the world. It shows that beauty is immortal in love. It's what brings that wonderful, youthful feeling within yourself when you have love in your life in any capacity. And this isn't to say that love is perfect or without struggle. Couples fight and they argue and they hurt each other and they cry. Um, this is not to be attributed to abuse. You got to know the difference. But the beauty in that kind of love that I mentioned is the kind of love that screams, I hate you, but I will never leave you because I fucking love you. A little peck on the forehead and that warm hug. Because while love is frustrating, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing that despite all that scientific explanation and chemical cocktail in our brain, you know, we mash it up together and, you know, we turn it into something more meaningful in this short time that we have on this little fucking space rock. We try, we chase, and we dream of it almost every day of our lives until we get it. And some of us will chase that life of love forever, be it in our craft or with another person. Live a life with intention that love is in and around all of us, despite all the ups and downs that we experience with situationships or fuck buddies or whatever else we assign the name for just sex. We are on a quest to find the warm love over the chemical love, the love of familiarity and trust over the doped blind love. Chase love with the intention of warmth and safety instead of chemical bonding by itself. Get to know those around you. Fall in love as many times as you can and do it over and over and over again until you get it right. Jump now and fear later because if love is all that I have, when I take my last breath, I think I'll feel like the wealthiest woman in the fucking universe. That's right. I fucking said it. I'm a cheesy ass bitch. And I fucking own that shit. All right, guys. I love you. As usual, if you liked this podcast, please share it with somebody that you love, you feel needs to hear this. I love all of you guys, and I will see you guys soon. Bye-bye now. Yeah.